everyone. Welcome to Contact Lost, the Polish podcast about Warhammer 40k, the Polish scene, as, as well as the international scene. Um, today I have two fantastic guests uh, to uh, talk about the recent, I think, biggest tournament uh, that took place uh, in, let's say, the recent times. Uh, so we're going to be talking about LGT. However, uh, you know, we are not going to do any list analysis or anything like that. I think 17 different podcasts and, and YouTubers have already done that. So today we are going to do something completely different. We are actually going to check what LGT looks like behind the scenes. And to talk about that, uh, who else could help me better than uh, the people who actually run the event when it happens? So with me today, I have the head referee of WTC and the main referee of uh, LGT, I give you Neil Kerr. Whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for thank you for agreeing to uh, to do this. Uh, it's really, really nice to have you. F first of all, really nice to meet you. Uh, but also, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm dying to hear the insights uh, from the tournament. Yeah, of course. It's my pleasure to be on. We've already Fantastic. talked for about 45 minutes off, off, yeah, exactly. off, uh, off podcast. So. Yeah, exactly. We already know each other quite well. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, so, and, and that that's, we know each other so well, uh, thanks to our second guest, who was a little bit late, but this gave us fantastic time to, uh, yeah, to, to, to get to know each other. So the second guest is the second uh, of the three referees uh, that we had at the LGT. Um, please welcome Maciej Pumba Gujec. Hello, everybody. Hi, dude. And again, uh, like with Neil, uh, thanks for accepting the invite. Um, it's really, really, really nice to have you. My pleasure. So I also wanted to bring in uh, the third referee, so Piotr, uh, also known as known as Tiffus. However, uh, Piotr has some, uh, let's say, uh, work commitments, and he couldn't join us. However, um, but, well, to be, to be honest, he he he's rubbish. He didn't do any work at all, did he? Pumba? Oh, I've heard. <laughs> true, true, true. And also, his excuses yeah. will be quite lame because he's not working; he's drinking. <laughs> so. I mean, I mean, how many Actually, steps? That's the how best many, yeah. Yeah, how probably. many steps was it? Sixty thousand steps or something? He did. So he said, yeah, but but then you know he made a small correction and he he actually said that it wasn't exactly sixty. Uh, at the event, it was just forty-five. So well, not not really a big feat. <laughs> But yeah, uh, so uh, what I what I've done is, you know, I have a I have a bunch of questions, and I prepared those questions uh, in advance. Um, so uh, I did send them to Piotr as well, and uh, although you know he wasn't able to record his answers, he did send them to me in writing. So uh, we'll see how it goes. I'll try to somehow you know weave in whatever he had sent me into our conversation. If that works fine, if not, I'll drop it and I'll just make a post on Facebook or Instagram uh, with whatever he wrote. So, um, so yeah, so I guess we can we can get to the uh, nitty gritty of it. And uh, I'll ask you guys to maybe just introduce yourself at the, at the beginning because I, I, I did say what your role is, but maybe you could explain to our listeners like how did you get there? What was your road to uh, becoming referees at the LGT. So Neil, can I start with you? Yeah, sure. So my name's Neil. I've been playing 40k since first edition, competitively since the middle of second edition. So a really, really long time. I think it's like 26 years we've been playing competitive 40k. Um, <clears throat> and I used to be the Team Scotland captain back in the very early days of the ETC, which was great fun. Um, but over over the time years of playing ETC, I got more and more fed up with the endemic cheating that certain teams, certain players, you know, had. And it just was part of ETC back in the day was cheating was almost like accepted because so many people did it. I just got really fed up with it, and so in kind of my usual attitude, do things. I went, well, if no one else is going to sort it, I will. So I I, made, I I basically convinced everyone to make me head ref, and then I went about with a you know, metaphorical stick and beat everybody else over the head to behave. And after nearly 10 years of being the head ref, yeah, well, it's pretty good now. It works. <laughs> so and that's what I call commitment. Like you yeah. really have to, have to, you know, be tired of, of, of cheating if you decided to actually go ahead and become a referee. Yeah, How bad it was, was it? 
It was bad. I mean, it was really bad. It was horrific. I mean, I just, I used to, because Team Scotland back in the day was not a competitive team at all. It was basically, are you Scottish? Do you have the time and the money to go to Europe and play 40k? Come with us. You know, we had guys showing mm-hmm. up. They didn't know. They didn't know. Uh, famously, a guy playing Gasgol didn't realize Gasgol could like to make his armor save and vulnerable and stuff like this. You know. <laughs> um, so it was very much like a, and I used was I was the strongest player by far on the team. Um, so I used, to, I used to, when we went to play to certain teams and we knew that maybe this team has a particular person on the team that's got a reputation, I would always try to engineer it so I played that person just to take one for the team because mm-hmm. I, I, don't, I don't care and these guys are here to have fun. But I just got tired of it as well. I just got tired of the bullshit. I got tired of after every ETC, every single year, everyone's complaining about X team, X player again and again and again and again. And it's like, well, if we need to do something about it. So... I used to be a T. I was a boy. Well, I am still a T. I was a very big T O in the UK at the time. Um, I just said, well, I know how to run events. I know how to, you know, manage players at my events. It's not going to be any different to the ETC. And by this point, most people knew who I was. So I just said, I'll do it. I'll be the referee. I will change the system. And I just sort of like laid out what I want to do. And everyone went, yeah, yeah, do that. Because they're thinking like previously, many other people had said they were going to clean up the ETC and hadn't done anything. Hmm. Um, and I said I was going to do it. And then. Um, uh, a, a not at all famous person called Tom Adriani um, said, yeah, this, I'll, I'm going to back him up. And him through being like one of the organisers and stuff and me being the referee, we just basically literally, you know, beat people into submission. <laughs> like this is this this is this is like this is how this is the acceptable way to play 40k. This is like cheating is not acceptable. And like I remember the first year um, in like one of the like, well, first or second round, I docked a team over 50 points. For straight mm. up, for straight up the amount of cheating they were pulling, wow. and I was just like, no, this is just, and people people learn very quickly. And the thing is that the, the team, the worst teams, actually now actively have like worked really hard to change reputations, and they are, and then now they're seen as some of the best teams to play against. And they're, you know, I mean, I'll say I'll call out Russia. Russia is a great example. Russia had a terrible reputation. They were one of the teams that no one wanted to play. Now Russia is a team everybody wants to play, despite the fact that you'll probably lose to Russia because they are that good. But they've cleaned their act up because you can win. You don't have to cheat to win, and that's what it's about. So I did that for many years, and then basically I met Zach in 2016 at the Spanish ETC, mm-hmm. and sort of kept in touch with one and off. Obviously, the LGT did not have the best success the first few years out through various re- various things that happened and various high public like things that were publicised quite a lot over the internet. And then Zach basically said to me, "Hey, I'd like you to come and ref- can you come and referee, please?" Because obviously. You want, we'd like to have somebody who's got the experience, somebody who is not intimidated with all the top players, because I know them all. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously looks good for the LGT to have, you know, myself and the, the reputation that comes with me there. So that's yeah. how it came about. And then part of the deal was, I said to Zach, absolutely. Um, but here's the deal. It's not just me. You have to bring at least two other people with me. I gave him a list of names, and on that list was well, very much... Pretty much at the top of the list was Tommy Gianni and Tiffus. Tom couldn't come because he has a family. Mm-hmm. So Tiffus was coming and Tiffus basically said, oh, I have somebody who will be really good. And Pumba came and that's how I met Pumba. Beautiful. All right. So, yeah, Pumba. I don't, I don't know which one should I use, Pumba or Mate? Which one do you prefer? I think Pumba is preferable. As this okay. Is well, you never, reply, you never reply to Mate. I shout Mate at you. Last weekend, I would scream it, and, <laughs> and you, would, you would ignore it. I would whisper Pumba across, I'm, I'd quietly I'm, whisper it, and, it would, and, and from across the hall, I would hear coming. <laughs> so I, I think that's that's that. By the way, I, you know, to our listeners have probably figured out by now uh, that um, Polish players identify, uh, or you know, uh, are usually called some nicknames, and they hardly ever appear anywhere under their real names oh, and I super guess, true. It, it's not just polish players it's most european players most people outside of the uk and sweden know me as scuzz because that was my online name for years all right and a, and a lot of the etc players a lot of poles still call me scuzz like skark still calls me scuzz for example so uh, yeah. what, what, what where, where does it come from i mean I, I thought that for poland it boils down to the fact that Polish community has used forums for a yeah. really, really long time, and basically, you know, nothing else. Discord is a is a pandemic invention, so to say. Uh, I think so. So, so is it is it the same for other countries? Same, same thing. Same okay. thing. It's just all these new children that use like Facebook and stuff. Like, all right. 
<laughs> like myself. All right. Um, okay. Anyway, Pumba, then, um, you know, your story probably isn't uh, as as comprehensive. Long, as comprehensive. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 how did how did you you know how did it come about? How did it happen so, that you became um, the rat? I'm kind of at the exact opposite of Neil because I'm a very new addition, relatively speaking, uh, to the 40k community as a whole, because I've started playing probably at the start of 8th edition. I've played some games of 7th, but mainly 8th. Um, so what I, what happened basically, um, I became a TO of Krakow, uh, second, uh, Polish second biggest city. Mm -hmm. um, and I became, because of the pandemic, um, pretty much all of the Polish community uh, moved into the Discord. We, we made our own Discord server, which um, pretty much uh, from people from across Poland joined. And the community stra started to uh, expand really fast, especially, Fine, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I became active there as a person who knew English pretty well and liked to organize things and also discuss rules because as we all know, uh, GW's rules aren't always of the best quality and interpretation is always needed. Um, and this is big, basically uh, how I got to know Tifus. And because, I, to be honest, he, he told me that I was his second choice beca uh, behind uh, David, who, who is known in the community as Dave, who was also a WTC um, ref for a couple of times, I believe. Uh, but, but he wasn't available. So Tifus uh, asked me to just come as he, as I was known for uh, my English and also my ability to quickly find rules, which is very needed. Rare. Such as, yeah, <laughs> rare too, but I think very, very needed in, in the situation of refing a hundred person tournament. So this is uh, how I became the LGT referee and got to know Neil. That's, that's fantastic. So, uh, so tell me this, do you guys actually, you know, find it enjoyable to to referee because it's it's a duty it's it's something that you have to do you know refing a, a 600 man event is uh is quite an achievement but but do you do you have fun while doing it because to me my experience is that you know no one ever wants to be a tournament organizer and no one ever wants to be the ref because first of all it's very hard to like you know divide your attention between playing and refing and then also all the people coming to you asking for rules and over and over and over the same questions and so on sounds like a masochistic feat to be honest so do you have fun while doing it neil so i thought you were going to say nobody wants to be a referee in poland because of vladdy hi vladdy <laughs> hey vladdy <laughs> what a call out what a call out i i i love vladdy he's great we all but, um, um no, I mean, like I said, it started off as like a thing. I was just, I was so fed up with it all, the ETC. And I was really passionate about ETC, you know, the community, the people. So I tried to change it. And I did. Um, is it masochistic? Yeah, it's hard work. It is hard work. But it's really rewarding. And also, honestly, I like, I'm not someone, that, I used to be a person that chased the meta all the time. But now my life has moved on. I don't have the time or mm -hmm. frankly the energy to sort of chase the meta and try to always be the very very sharp edge of everything um and i enjoy more and more just going to towards socialize and when you're a referee you actually have a lot of time to socialize you can actually spend a lot you spend less time than you'd imagine running around a lot more time just chilling at tables saying hi to people you know even at the lgt there was three of us and 600 players I, I mean, I don't know about you, Pumba, but I'd easily say maybe 20% of the time we were there, we were actually actively refereeing, and the rest of the time we were just walking around chilling. True. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Don't you make it sound cool? Yeah, it's, it's really... It's, I mean, why... What, what, the question... I say this. Why do you play in tournaments? I mean, I think for most people, the core reason is because you want to hang out with friends, meet friends. The social part of the hobby that attracts people, and tournaments is obviously very social. Mm -hmm. And being a referee, it's... You don't lose out on that social side at all. In fact, I, I, like I, said, I even think you get more time to be social. Um, so it's like you, you're involved in the tournament the same way, It'll, just in a different way, but you're getting the same out of it. So it works. Okay, Pumba, um, your, your it's take? A, it's a tough question for me to answer because my main experience is from a referee comes from my local scene so far, but I find it just rewarding to do. Um, 
I think I was definitely more stressed than Neil uh, during LGD because obviously because I have less experience in that. But at the same time, um, just walking out the tables and seeing people uh, being able to just come up to you and ask for some some questions and being able to help them uh, making the event run smoothly is just rewarding for me. Mm. I find it fun. And uh, as, as, as Neil said, uh, the part where you just can stop for a second, hand, hang out with people, like comment or they, on their games, on their plays, and how the dice are, ro are rolling and stuff like that. It's just a great uh, perspective on the event, something completely different from actually playing. Okay. I still, I still would consider myself for a time uh, more of a player than a referee, because I'm actively um, competing at the, uh, for for now. I would like to join the Polish national team in the future if that's possible. Obviously, who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I think the aspect of just organizing such event fascinates me. All right. So, yeah. So tell me about the LGT then. I mean, you know, I during the LGT, uh, I was active on Discord. I, I did see, uh, you know, some pictures from the event and some comments that you guys made in the Polish Discord and so on. Um, you made it look like it was really hard work, especially that, you know, you, I, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, but I took that from the pictures that you needed to help set up the tables and, uh, I don't know, do some other or organize, organizational stuff. So it wasn't just Saturday, Sunday refereeing games. It was much more, I think. So, Neil, is, is it is it a, a good understanding of the situation? Yeah, for Tiffus and their Pumba it is. I showed up. Yeah. At 11, <laughs> I showed up at eleven o'clock on Friday night. Oh, how come after, after, after and, and also I showed up to having you know Tiffus having a beer ready for me, and then we went to the hotel. So I didn't do any of the setup. But uh, these guys, they showed up obviously early on. They showed up early in London, did some sightseeing, went down to the venue, and helped uh, Zach and all the other people sort of set things up. So they, they worked a bit harder than me, actually. Yeah, we became involved because we just were at the, um, at the venue so, so, uh, at a year, earlier time than Neil. Uh, and it, we just became, it's hard to refuse like basic tasks because you, you quickly become a part of the community when you see all, all of the other TOs actually working on the event. So if there was something to do, something quick, like setting up the um, raffle tables or the rewards or stuff like that, we just helped because why not? But yeah, uh, there was a lot of work involved. I think more than we initially expected. But at the same time, I didn't mind it at all. I was just tired <laughs> after the fact. <laughs> Did you also help clean to clean up the you know the venue after the event? Uh, we helped a bit, but not too much, as we were actually refing the finals when the venue was getting cleaned up after the the main event, because um, the the main part of the event ended after five rounds, but the top four players moved on to uh, moved on, uh, into a bracket format, mm -hmm. uh, basically playing semi-finals and finals uh, at the very late evening. Like uh, I think finals started at 8 p.m. or something like that after a whole day of playing. So yeah, we were at the top tables, but we, it, when we had time uh, or a bit of a break, we helped with cleaning up the tables and stuff. Okay, so it, it really does sound like hard work. So uh, kudos to you guys for you know actually going there and helping as well, not just uh, breathing. So um, let's put it in, in, in some order. How does reffing at an event of that scale work? I mean, I can imagine picture with my eyes, you know, or in my mind right now, be like a, a huge hall, 600 people talking over one another. So it's loud as hell. And then there is just the three of you uh, running between the tables. How did you guys communicate? Like, how did you, how did you find each other at an event like that? Did you have like any technology on you or how did that work? Yeah, so credit to Zach. Um, he came up with a system, which I was actually super skeptical about um, going into it, but it worked amazingly so we all had we all had walkie talkies and earpieces so we could obviously communicate with each other you know like 
just basically talk to each other. Mm-hmm. But then, but then obviously you've got three referees and six people. How do you avoid everyone just putting their hands up, shouting ref, and you've been running racket? So what Zach did is there was actually two other referees which deserve, which actually deserve a massive round of applause. Rich and Tom. Yeah. And these guys, these guys were legendary because what Zach had done, he'd set up a WhatsApp number for the event for rules questions, and so players were not meant to grab us randomly uh-huh. um well if they were meant to leave if, if we were near the table they could grab us but they weren't meant to, they weren't they weren't meant to leave the tables and go find us <coughs> excuse me instead they were to send their question to this whatsapp to the to the whatsapp and they'd be like hi i'm dave i'm on table 42 uh i've got a question about blah 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 and then rich and tom would get were they'd get these questions sent to them from the whatsapp and where they could answer the questions they would answer the questions directly I'm so it was a, in, it, in it, awe it, of that solution. <laughs> it was a fantastic yeah. solution. So they so they actually filtered because so many questions you get are literally read the, read the rule book, RTFM, you know, read the freaking manual. Mm-hmm. Like there's so many of the questions are like that. Um, and they were like the they, they were like the the Chinese Great Wall. You know, they filtered that that firewall of Toy <laughs> like Rich. They 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 filtered so much out um, so that the, when the calls came to us, it was like. Um, can someone go to table 212? Da da, da da da. Can someone go to table 42? Da da da. Can someone go here? You know, and they were, that was that was us going to a table because there was a question they couldn't quickly answer, basically. And there could be anything from like check a range or check a line of sight to maybe like a more nuanced rules question. There isn't like a like, very quick direct answer, and that worked. We go to them. We just we had we had kind of like those the tables were all set up in basically in basically five big rows. Which meant there were three channels in the between the tables, and we basically each had a channel, and we just kind of move up and down all the tables like that. And then if there was a question, say like we boom, we'll go to the table, I go to the table. It's like oh, this is actually a very complex question. Then if we could have made the, the answer ourselves easily, we didn't call the other two guys to come. So exactly. if there was, a, so if there was an, if there was, if we had to make a decision, an, if we had to give an answer that wasn't clearly written down, because LGT was playing raw, Zach wanted it all ruled raw. Mm-hmm. So the, what if it wasn't a clear raw answer, then we'd call in the other two guys, get a quick, 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 literally thirty second discussion, and make the decision between us. So yeah, Pumba, I wanted to ask because you know you you said it was your first like major event refereeing or well event of that scale. So were there any, ever times where when you felt overwhelmed by by all this? What what Neil was talking about, like you know all the questions coming in, running from table to table. Etc. Uh, or, or or was it you know under control? I think due to the system that was set up, which was again as Neil said, amazing. I was super impressed. Uh, I think for, to give you a perspective, I think during the first two rounds of LGT, um, which were more obviously more casual, as people just played random people, not brackets, not the, there weren't many um, like winning people, winning uh, playing winning people, stuff like that. I think we I got less question asked during the, those two first first rounds than in my local event, where which has like thirty people. Mm. I'm not kidding. It was amazing. The amount of stuff uh, Tom and Rich filtered through the WhatsApp made our jobs super easy, at least for the first couple of rounds. There were hectic uh, moments when there were like three calls to different tables and especially some rules appeared like th- that um, were not easily answerable and we need to we need, we need to collaborate on a definite uh, ruling we just had to come up with a ruling on the spot but still nothing overwhelming at all which was very su- surprising i talked to tifos about that that we thought as initially we thought there were uh, going to be at least 10 refs then uh, some like a figure of 5 came up and then we turned out there were only 3 of us in the actual field and still it worked perfectly yeah it sounds impressive to say the yeah way. i mean i can say that this was easier to referee the wtc so do you think this could become a, 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 a like an international standard, or, or is it already a standard? I mean, I do, I do, idea, I do believe Zach is willing to, um, for a small consultancy fee, <laughs> <laughs> um, help set this up. But I mean, I, I told him straight up, like Zach, I'm, I am, I'm, I'm using this for the, for the WTC because this is just a, a, it obviously needs to be tweaked to the WTC because we have a language barrier there as well. Hmm. Um, 
but we'll work away to we'll get we'll find a way to make a system similar work because it is just so it's so it, it works just that's the end of it it just works so well the combination of we had a pre-event faq for who could submit questions we answered them again it was answered raw so it's different for wtc answers but mm -hmm. we answered those questions so that helped and then this june event it just made it so much smoother it just you weren't wasting you weren't having your time wasted and i say this it is wasted by players who haven't just read the core rules because a lot of the time you get these questions they're, just, they're in the core rule book the player just hasn't bothered to read the rule book properly hmm. uh, were there any were there any 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 house rules at the event or, or did you just decide to go with raw and that's it so the main um the, the line of the event and the line uh which zach basically proposed uh and stick to as Neil said, was just playing raw. Rules is written was the name of the game, which mm -hmm. is absolutely understandable because um, most, if not uh, like all of the pe uh, players playing in the LGT are playing raw by themselves or in smaller events. So if you don't have a system, if you would propose uh, sweeping changes like the WTC FAQ sometimes does, it would make a lot of players confused, incredibly confused at the uh, at the time of the event. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's give, let's be honest. From the 600 people attending, probably 200 of them read the entire rules pack and the event pack. So if there were some, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean Malik, who won the whole thing, didn't read the event pack. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so if if you would consider people having to go through um, 80 pages of uh, sweeping changes. That would be incredibly hard to uh, to actually like rule by. There will okay. be uh, so much confusion um, in the like during games that it would mm -hmm. be no, we would be wouldn't be able to handle that. I believe so. Yeah, when we could and when there wasn't any, um, <laughs> if there weren't rules that clearly being played as raw made the game incredibly confusing or just broken we went with raw i think the the biggest thing we ruled there was a game being played at the streaming table by the way oh the spicy details start go on <laughs> um there was there was this game uh between uh, a guy who was playing terminus s um death guard who actually came third or fourth i believe in the whole event and he played against uh necrons with uh ghost Arcs. Mm -hmm. And the guy playing Necrons just made a wall of Ghost Arcs. But it turned out that his box workers, combined with the exact height of those Ghost Arcs, made it possible to, for the box workers he was playing to go under them during charge phase. Uh -huh. And there is clearly nothing at the rule, in the rulebook preventing you from doing that. Because there isn't. In WTC, it's very easily resolved by uh, just just the projection of the hole onto the battlefield is considered your base and that solves everything. But yeah, when you're playing just by the rules of the game, there's nothing you're preventing to, you to just go under another model. We had a rule, that, that was one of the things we decided to get against that. Um, we, there is a thing in the flyer section that just tells you um, you can go under flyers, but that's just this very, um, Weak ruling, I would say. Weak, weak thing to um, to base your ruling about. So that was one of the things we decided was absolutely gonna break the game in half if we allowed that. Okay. There so are so many broken interactions you could probably have with those when you when you allowed people to do that. Like um, from famous examples throughout uh, 40k history, I think hiding your uh, farseer or some uh, elder character in the middle of the of the wave, wave serpent hall and being absolutely unchargeable is something that can just come up from that ruling alone from being raw and can be game changing at times exactly mm. yeah. all right so and i think uh, i think sorry, I was also saying, on, it's, it's also quite important like one of the big reasons i wanted to do this raw um is because there's 600 players um i would say e half if not more of those players are casual players they're just going to the tournament to roll dice for a weekend and be with their mates they are not hardcore tournament players so like like Pumba said rightly they're not going to read a WTC 
FAQ. They're not going to read a 20 page FAQ. They're just not interested. They just want to let you roll dice. So playing raw is easier for them, which is the difference when you go to the WTC. Obviously, it's like the best players from every country. So the level is higher and therefore you need to be tight on the rules, hence the FAQ. So it's very much like a going raw, very much played into what the majority of the players were as well. All right. So I'm, I'm reading through the words that, that Tiffus had sent to me earlier. And uh, actually, uh, what he writes is very much in line with what you said, but he adds on top and says, you know, people, furthermore, people actually looked up the rules in the rule book or FAQ themselves yes. instead of straight up asking us. And he says, and I quote, completely different mentality. And I understand, uh, end of quote, and I understand this is, you know, uh, uh, in comparison to Poland, where I guess, at least from my experience, whenever there is a dispute uh, at the table, usually someone just shouts out ref and then you know there's a rules question and uh and that's how it's resolved so yeah this mm -hmm. is this is definitely something me and tifus talked about uh, at the hotel like after the venue like we were so impressed with the community as a whole as player base because there were so many like when you were walking uh, your aisles and uh, saw people just playing the game and if there was any dispute or anything, the first thing they did, instead of calling us, was actually open the book. Which I know sounds ridiculous, but doesn't happen that often <laughs> during Polish tournaments. But that's why it's in the rules pack. Yes. Yeah, I mean, this is like a thing. This comes from, this is a thing I suggested to Zach um, a couple of years ago, when I was first talked about going to the LGT, is that obviously a lot of questions be innocent or not can be answered by the referee the players reading the rules themselves which takes time off the referees so, so if we only have so few of us so many players we need to be very hard about referees time being wasted so we did so there is actually in the lgt rules pack it's taken basically for verbatim from the wtc pack where if a player asks a question that is in the rule book it's clearly very clearly answered in the rule book or their codex then they can get a warning or a penalty for type wasting time basically Mm. So it's quite it's quite draconian, but it does then mean the players actually look at the rules because so they don't want to get in trouble, and it so, solves so mm -hmm. many questions. So, so about that, uh, you know, with, with such such a huge event with so many players sticking or not sticking, but rather sticking to the rules um, behind us, what's your view on the on the current rule set? I mean, ninth edition, uh, new rules. Um, is the rule book a referee's friend or foe? How do you how do you find it? Pumba, how maybe I'll start with you. Uh, do you think that the rules are well written right now, or there could you know you, they could use some tweaks? I think there is definitely an improvement from eighth to nine, especially in how the uh, ninth edition rulebook is written and structured. I think the uh, things are easier to find than they were, uh, but does this does not mean that the, everything is always clear? And it will never be, especially in such like large and extensive game, expansive game. Sorry, but yeah, I I find the rulebook of ninth edition to be quite clear. The problem often comes from um, not not being consistent, especially in codexes, and 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 in codices sometimes like um, there are very similar rules that have completely different wordings and how they fit into the ninth edition uh, rulebook is sometimes very clunky and sometimes just not existent at all. Neil, your take? Yeah, 100% agree, 100% agree. I mean, yeah, the ninth edition rules as like written are better, was written better than the eighth book, which is exactly what Pumba says. It's, there are still inconsistencies, there are still failings. I think as well, just like obviously building what Pumba said as well, I think there's also a big issue if there are a lot of a lot of armies I mean, more than half the armies are still playing with eighth edition codexes which means they are playing with eighth edition rules that try to port into a new rule set and there's lots, lots of issues there as well um i mean that's why i'm part of the, that's why the wcfaq exists for me and tom and it's like so long it's just unfortunately gw just you know misses the ball doesn't do it or whatever but it's just it's, it's such a complicated game like uh, Pumba said, I just don't think GW aren't interested in getting bogged down in the minutia. Mm -hmm. whereas, whereas we are competitive players and we are obsessed by the minutia. <laughs> you know, we're always looking for every advantage, every way to sort of like, you know, break break the game, mm -hmm. find that trick that no one else has found before. So we so we do do it. And that's just, that's just a case of the guys who write the rules of GW are not tournament players like we are. 
So yeah. there's, mm -hmm. there's got to be an acceptance of that, I think. So that's also, again, uh, to quote uh, Tiffos, rulebook is fine. The issue are the codices, which differ a lot between each other with the wording. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's exactly that's in line. I mean, with a really good a really example is in Pumba. How many times did you get asked about the custodies interrupt strap? <laughs> oh my god! Um, not only like the <laughs> that yeah. or or anything that call especially my favorite um, from the recent uh, recent codices is definitely the redeployment stuff. Yeah, <laughs> hey, that's it. Because it's like like. The, 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 <laughs> The, the Custodius uh, intro strat is from 8th edition. And obviously, GW have written this massive FAQ and like designers' commentary on how fights first, fights normally, fights last, and interrupts, how these all work. And then the Custodius one just completely ignores all of that, basically. The, it, just, it, 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 just, it, just, it just says they get to fight next. And just by saying they fight next breaks all the rules. Mm -hmm. The FAQ should be written. And it's a perfect... There's, uh, if I may, there is a difference between uh, that and current counter offensive stratagem, the, the basic yeah. basic interrupt, because it um, it was especially specifically changed to target an eligible unit. I mean the counter offensive one, which um, the Custodos one didn't get that treatment, so it just completely breaks the FAQ designer's commentary everything. And there's, like I said, there's these kind of examples, and a lot of them are eighth edition hangovers, or like I said, it's inconsistencies. The redeployment strats. So I think every pretty much every codex has got that's come out in ninth has got some form of redeployment strat, and every single one is worded differently. So you know, just for a second, steering away from LGT, yeah. uh, does it happen that G Dubs reaches out to you know? To yourselves, I mean, to to like the ref community or something like that, to find out about you know the absurdities on of of, of some of the like rules or stratagems or, or whatever they've written to check if those things actually make sense, if they work, and maybe they should be amended. That that does that, 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 that happen? Sort of. <laughs> I might get I might get this, I might get I don't think I'll get into trouble because I haven't signed any NDAs. So Tommy mm. Girani. Obviously, anybody who's on the ETC knows Tom. Tom is the main uh, guy who drives the FAQ for the WTC, and he is a playtester as well for GW. And he is really, and he has for a long time been the guy that's been like from the playtester side pushing the FAQ, the, G, the FAQ questions to GW. And previously, GW had a very had a very, did not like the idea of the ETC for various reasons, um, but basically over the past maybe like two years. Mike Brandt came to the DTC. Obviously, he really enjoyed himself. He really like started to understand what we're doing. Um, it's not an elitist thing. It's actually quite the idea is much more inclusive than that. And now he's obviously the big man at GW for events and everything. And Mike Brandt is also the head of the playtesters. He is in charge of all playtesting. Um, and so Mike has basically put Tom in touch with um, the head rules writers at GW, and Tom has regular conversations with them. And they basically said, well, you know, send us your, the first it was like, why don't you send us, we, don't, we want to see the WTC FAQ. And that's evolved to that now there is a group that's not, play, we're not playtesters at all. We don't get to see the rules early. We see the rules and you guys see the rules as well. There's a group of us, which is like, you know, WC guys, Goonhammer, um, the FLG referees, from like mm -hmm. uh, El Leona. There's a bunch of like referees or rules guys who are very well known, who are very known within the community, very savvy on rules. And we're part of like this kind of like unofficial GW FAQ group. And we basically, through Tom, we channel all these questions that are coming in from all different parts of the community for all these events and all these different you know places like, like Europe and America. And we kind of channel it into one document that we send to GW. Okay. So, so every Every couple of weeks, you know, we get some document offers that says these are the questions and these are suggested fixes. And then GW, use it or not. Um, there's lots of poly there's lots of other complicated things involved in how, which questions GW can answer and how many questions there are they, they can answer as well. Because there's, there's a lot of business, um, there's lots of business influences into the, the FAQs. You know, don't don't publish a big FAQ and all this kind mm -hmm. of thing. It can reflect badly. There's all that stuff, but a lot of this, but there's a lot of stuff being fed into GW directly from people on the front lines. And the Goomhammer guys are very well known in the community, very respected, and they are the guys who write the the, uh, the rules, the rules of the FAQ stuff for Goomhammer. They're feeding. They're in the part of this group. So we're all kind of trying to. 
we're trying to create it so there's like one message going to UW. So instead of like lots and lots of different voices, trying to like help like channel the message to them so it's easy for them to understand like these are the real issues. So do you think that maybe, yeah, Pumba, can you tell me, because you, you are familiar with the WTC rules as well. Do you think that, you know, those rules could be applicable to tournaments like LGT and, you know, it would make refereeing even easier or at an event like that, it would actually introduce more complication? I would love them to, but I completely get, um, as we talked earlier about implementing it in mm -hmm. the whole, how it just causes so many so much trouble uh, yeah. for players and for referees too i would love i would love uh, what i would mostly love is for gw to just implement parts of that faq in their faq which solves so much issues because it, it, especially um zach from everyone uh, the main or, uh, tournament organizer for the lgt also does uh, pretty much monthly events for hundreds of people. If he implemented the WTC FAQ for just LGT, that would mean um, he needed to do that same thing for ev his every event with different people in different parts of the UK. It's a whole thing. So yeah. I don't believe because it's domino effect. Yeah, and, and there's yeah. a lot of politics there as well. Exactly. Zach, Zach is a playtester as well. Um, he's actually he is he is one of he's the head UK playtester. And there's a lot of politics there that if Zach same with same with Reese and Frontline Gaming, you know, mm -hmm. GW doesn't want these really big event organizers that run a lot. That you know, Zach is basically going to dominate the UK scene. Just like FLGs kind of decided to dominate the American scene. GW, from a business point of view, politically, GW don't want these guys issuing an FAQ because then people will play that. There will be that FAQ that becomes the de facto, and ergo, people will be playing a different game system to the GW game system. And the, yeah, the intended one. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you know, that's. It, it, I say it's politics, but it's, it's business. At the end of the day. It's not. It's, it's business. You understand the business, the, the business side from GW. GW wants to make this game open, inclusive to all. And the idea, especially Mike Brandt, Mike Brandt believes that 100%. That every, that he believes remotely that everyone, everyone around the world should play the same game. You should be able to go to any country in the world, walk into any gaming tournament or, or gaming venue or like club or whatever, and play, you play the same game regardless. Well, it's, it's hard to disagree with that concept. It is hard to disagree. It's just you know. The WTC FAQ comes from the the the, universe, the very 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 elite microcosm, the niche microcosm of WTC, where again it's the, the very very top players from all countries competing, and they're competing at a level that is like equivalent to the final at the LVO or the final at the LGT. Mm -hmm. But every game is like that at the WTC, and because these are players who are, as you know, you obviously the lad, the guys in Poland, the WTC players in Poland. They 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 look at the they look at the rules word for word. They look for these loopholes, these inconsistencies, and in how to exploit them. Yeah, and rules lawyering and so on. Exactly. So the WTC FAQ is there to clamp down on the worst successes of that. I think. Whereas, of... whereas the GW FAQs are designed for Joe Blogs, you know, Dave, whatever, who's literally just rocking up to his local club and playing games. And it's a they're, they're very different target audiences. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I and I think long term. They will always remain. They, they need. They, they should remain target audiences. It's like Pumba said. I, this. I don't want. You don't want to have like everybody who goes to tournament have to go through the WTC FAQ. People wouldn't want. A lot of people who go to tournaments are casual and they don't want to go through that kind of FAQ. And if you made them do it, they probably wouldn't go. You would turn them away. I think one of the greatest achievements, actually, of Polish community as a whole, is implementing the WTC FAQ from like bottom floor. Every single tournament from uh, which I know runs this FAQ. I'm talking my tournaments in Krakow. I'm talking uh, Warsaw's local events. Every small event has it implemented, which makes the whole of the Polish uh, like tournament scene very integrated into the, uh, GW rule set. Yeah, it's uh, also very cool because it, it it like stimulates the you know the local communities in that at least they 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 try. For example, to have terrain that meets, you know, a common standard or something like that. So I, I think that that improved a lot because you, in the past you used to go to different like locations to Tree City or Krakow or Warsaw or Lublin, uh, and you would uh, like get 
completely different sorts of terrain and some armies worked there but didn't work in a different location now it's more like you know condensed uh it works better just because everyone sticks to one rule set absolutely yeah, th sorry if i may um i think that's that is one of the things that makes polish community in k community as a whole very much more competitive than average like uh english player for example or american player we are very from from every single event you just if you if you know the rule set if you're just forced into it kind of but from the very start when you're just beginning to play your tournaments it just comes more naturally than implementing it uh on a huge event just out of the blue because mm -hmm. now now everywhere you go in poland you, as you said you basically paint the same rule set and even though the faq is uh, expansive and big and uh changes many of the things it makes the game better in my opinion it just straight up does i think though as well it's a it's a cultural thing because again like say in sweden like a lot of a lot of tournaments in sweden they either use the wtfaq or they're heavily influenced by it um, I think the same goes for a lot, of, I would say, for the many, many countries, except the UK and America. And I think, and this is the only thing that's I think a lot of this to do with that, you know, the UK, England, there's, it's, America and England are the two biggest gaming communities there are. You know, Poland, you guys have said, like, you got a hundred or so, three hundred gamers, Sweden's like a hundred or so gamers. So you can implement these things. Everyone knows each other. And if you go to a tournament in Poland, you're going to be playing Skark and Vladdy and all that. So you, you, the game's already up straight away. Whereas you can go to a 100-man tournament in America and not meet a single quote-unquote top player. You know, you can, you can go to a 50, 60-man event in the UK and not meet a top player there either. Because yeah. there's just so many more players. And then the problem is because there's so many more players, the general perception of the WTC team is more negative, I feel. Because it's seen as this kind of very elite thing that a lot of people will never have an opportunity to get into because they don't have an opportunity to get into it they kind of become they have they develop a more negative attitude towards this there's more resistance therefore towards the faq and the polish community very much supports and backs the idea of there's a polish national team and you get them pretty much most of the players in the community want the polish national team to do very well whereas if you go to the uk and ask us like oh, when you go to the LGT, you ask a load of people who most of them would say they don't even know, they don't even care or know about the WTC. They're not interested in it or whatever. I think there is that as well. There's, there's a very different relationship to how the WTC is in many countries compared to how the WTC is in England and America. All right. We listen. We've been circling the the topic of something that you've mentioned already. So top players for a while. Uh, so I, I just wanted to ask. If you could tell me anything about the invitational, uh, so how, how how did that go? But I I don't really know what what the structure of that is. Is it like part of the entire event, or is it something on the side? Um, how how does this one play out? So this year's invitational, I believe, was completely new thing, and it was uh, completely separate from the main event. It was just a side event uh, on Friday in which, as the name suggests, players were just invited in. Uh, I believe it worked in uh, a bracket system. Basically, if you lost, you are out. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were, um, it was, I think it's just a promotional thing for Zach. Uh, he invited uh, best players or the most known players from across the, uh, from across England to, to just make sure they play each other and all everything was obviously streamed for for uh, everyone to see on twitch i think it's a great thing that promotes the main event it sounds like a pay-per-view or something like that yeah it, it, it was a hype train i mean he's actually yes. run, he's, he's run invitationals at the previous lgt's i think jeff robinson won one and mike Barant won the one and but um but they were like you know a lot of very like he was basically pick the best players from the LG who played in the LGT and very much he picked the guys, the top, top players to then play in an invitation against each other as well. But this year it was very much like a hype train. I mean, you had like, you know, Manny from Glass Hammer, Mikey from Hellstorm Wargaming. You had the guy from Real Space Raiders. You had a lot of um, internet celebrities, guys mm -hmm. that have big YouTube channels in the UK, big followings. And would like, like I said, they'll just generate interest. They'll generate hype in the event. 
and there's nothing wrong with that. I think you know. I think cool. that's that, that's one of the things that uh, grew immensely um, in recent years is the fact that 40k actually has its own celebrities now. Yeah, yeah. There are huge channels. Everyone knows, like Art of War, Glasshammer Gaming, stuff like that. There are huge, actual huge uh, content creators now. Same yeah. as in, in esports and stuff. It's one of the things I think many TOs will try to uh, use as their just marketing material. Absolutely. I mean, like, we won't be doing an invitation at WTC, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's almost we don't need to because we'll still have, you know, America from of Art of War versus Manny from Team England. So, <laughs> you know, that will happen and it is mega hype. And yeah, if you're a TO and you have these guys at your event, you know, you, you, of course you're going to try to abuse it as a marketing thing as much as anything else. You know, it's like when they, when they did the random, when they did the draw for round one, and it's a random draw, um, Malik drew Steve Box from Vanguard Tactics. Steve's a big name, Malik's a big yeah. name. So Zach posted it straight away on the LGT page. It's got like round one, big, big, big name show off uh, Steve versus Malik. That instantly creates hype, it instantly creates interest. You know, and that's and you need you want you want to probably you as a TO you want to expand your events. You need to create more interest, so that's the way to do it. Okay, so so from a ref's perspective, uh, is it difficult to you know rule or well you know to be a referee at, at, at a place at an event like that with people like that? Do you get starstruck when you know you get to meet those people? I think this is one of the reason we were chosen as the referees and neil was yeah and yes this, this is, this is why I, this, yeah this is why i asked like virtually like tom tiffus dave to come because they've got experience with it you know and they also, say open but you don't know these guys that well so it doesn't exactly. matter it's it's not um we have uh we have our own celebrities so to say right you mentioned vladi Vladi is the polish celebrity so i know him i've played him many times and from that, I know I have a, I can have a certain um, attitude towards such players. Uh, I think they have, they would have bigger impression or on some of uh, if if Zach decided to grab some local referees from England, because there, uh, I think they have such a huge um, just channels and and viewership that that the, the some people would just be scared to just confront them on many rules. Yeah, and that's, I, that's what I'm aiming at with that question. And uh, I, I love what, what Tifus uh, wrote in response to that question. Uh, I'll quote him here. He said, it might sound uh, egoistic, but no one is a celebrity to me in this community. I don't care who I'm ruling for or against. They are all players. If they have more publicity, who cares? And I think that's a healthy approach. I think one of the things that just comes up, uh, as we said, um, as a TO, you use these people and their um, their channels and their their fame to promote your event. So you need to be obviously uh, a little bit more careful, uh, like w what you talk about them or um, if you make a ruling uh, at their tables, especially as they are often playing at the top tables. But that's just a thing that referee does is um just make make uh, if you're at the top table uh sometimes your your judgment or your call makes more difference uh, as for the whole event right mm -hmm. so uh do you recall any you know any rules disputes from the invitational was there anything that uh the guys weren't able to you know figure out themselves uh, that they called you to a table or something like that or, or were they perfectly fine with the rules and didn't need your help so for the inv uh, for the invitational, as it happened on Friday, uh, we weren't really refing there. That's oh, that's okay. one of the things. Yes, Neil wasn't even uh, at, uh, in London at the time, and we joined and helped with organization. The whole thing was streamed live, and there were people knowledgeable about rules or knowledgeable enough about rules uh, all the time at the tables that there wasn't any re real need for us. To go like to, to go there and draft every single game. No, I was gonna say there's a big a big thing about the stream guys is that um, there were like three or four guys on the stream who are actually very very good tournament players. 
So they were both streaming and refereeing at the same time. Okay. All right. Which made our lives easy. Okay. But that's, that's really cool. So, uh, you know, I, I can't help but ask uh, about your opinion on uh, what happened in the final. So, uh, you know, I, I haven't heard of a tournament with a final where the game ends after half a turn. So would you blame that on the rules, the players abusing the rules or, you know, like building armies to abuse certain stuff? Um, were, according to you, as you know, the third people with the third sort of first perspective, where does the problem lie? I think the problem lie, it just speaks volumes about the current meta. That's it. Yeah. I yeah. don't blame the players at all. They are there to perform their best, to play the best list they can find to do well. So it's obvious to me that they will take the most ridiculous thing they can find in the in the whole rule set, in the whole yeah, every codex. Yeah. So I absolutely do not vote. blame the players at all for taking what they did, but it does speak volumes about the current situation the game is in. And it's not healthy. <laughs> Very, it's not just the finals. Uh, when we were refing the the top tables of of, of just the uh, normal tournament, very many games ended in a roll off. The first turn decided everything, and it's just is is extremely unhealthy. And I would consider that to be one of the things that might discourage some people from even coming to a tournament. Yeah, I agree. I mean. The one fact one fact I would say as well is the terrain. Um a lot of people commented that the terrain was lighter than like a normal ninth edition tournament and that favoured certain armies really well. Um like the if the the Admec Fires they went first, they got angles and you they shot you off. And that's what happened in the final, basically. Plus you have the the, the planes who would really ignore terrain. Yeah. So it was like it did, so that was a factor. The terrain was a factor then the armies, you know, if Admech went first, they generally were. I literally didn't see an Admech game on the top rows that went that went first and didn't win. Um, if you went first, but then they had like Jakari, if they went first, they won. So there's a lot of this going kind of go first win. Or if you play an Admech, Mac, go first, maybe win. And it's times really generalizing, but it kind of was like that. Um, as for the final, I mean, there was other factors involved. So... Malik went first, he flew his planes forward, he sold for flared his big Lucius blob, and he picked up four of Alex's dreadnought in the shoot dreadnoughts in the first shooting phase. And it's like, well, that's Alex's army gone, basically. So that's is Alex gonna come back from this? At the end of the day, Malik has to win by a single point to win. There's no differential, it doesn't matter, it's just win or lose. So it's like Alex is kind of he's just lost, you know, four of his six four of his six key models. He's probably gonna come back from it. This is the ninth game they played. In fact, no, because it was uh, Malik's tenth. Malik, it was, yeah, it was Malik. Yeah, it was, no, it was Malik's. Was it his tenth? Three, yes, six, actually. nine. His eleventh game for Malik because he played free the Invitational. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Holy, holy crap! That's, that's, yeah. that's eleven that's games yeah. of so, so three days. This, it, It's gone at eight o'clock at night. Everyone's tired. So this has just happened. It has Alex. Alex has a very. very very low chance of pulling the game back, to say the least. Especially against somebody of Malik's caliber. Malik is not going to make mistakes. Um, so there's those factors. And then also, there was a thing that happened. One of the uh, the streamers actually had an epileptic fit um, right as the game was about to start. And that's quite a scary thing to see. Um, it can be quite... The, guy was, the guy's fine. You need to put that out there. The, stre the, the, the streamers, they're all his friends. They knew what to do, and they dealt with it really well. But it obviously... Kind of put the put Alex and Malik in a very weird position. Like Malik actually didn't want to play at one point. He's like, I kind of, he's like, I kind of don't want to play this game now because it feels wrong, you mm. know. Um, so they were kind of like, you know, mentally in a weird place as well. Everyone got like chilled out. Everyone paused when like you know the, the streamer guys like, no, look, he's gonna be okay. We've dealt with this before. Don't worry about it, you know. So they decided to continue, but it's like there's all these factors, and it's just like saying they though. Alex lost four dreadnoughts, four of his six dreadnoughts in the first shooting phase. What's he, how is he going to come back from that? Probably not. So, well done, Malik. You win. That's basically it. 
Absolutely. Alex yeah. could have dragged the game out for another two hours and we could have been there till 11 o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. Would he, and he probably was still lost anyway. So uh, one thing, uh, probably one of the, 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 the last questions, and we, we will be drawing that to, to a clause, because I, I know that you, uh, Neil, probably have to run. Um, that was one of the comments that I, I've seen in the Polish Discord uh, when the tournament was, well, close to finishing, was that the, the, the win-lose-draw system is flawed. That had been, you know, a 20-0 sort of scoring uh, type, probably it would have looked different. Would you agree with that viewpoint? I think... Uh, as a whole of the tournament, it would definitely look different to an extent. I don't think it mattered so much in the last game, as Neil said, um, losing all so many of your tools to fight Admech in the first turn wouldn't make a big difference, because at the same time, um, let's not forget, this was basically already, uh, this was a grand final, right? So uh, even in 20-0 system, you would need to win by five points, right? Five small points, so 11 ninth would, would have done it. But as a whole, I wholeheartedly uh, preferred the 20-0 system in 40k in general. I think the differential makes the game more balanced, especially in metas that can be one-sided like that. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I prefer the 20 as well that's why i run it my events in sweden i mean the the win loss system creates a situation where you can design a list that does not interact with your opponent whatsoever um, and just it just tries to score points faster than your opponents and more than your opponents you know, a good example is the term and assess list that went to the semi-finals it wasn't designed to interact it was designed just to take up ball position and score points fast before you run out of models and uh, there's like zero interaction there which is not for me, not an interesting way to play 40k, so I prefer 20 nil. Would it make a difference to the LGT? There's 600 players. So there was like, was it 18, Bumba, who would have gone undefeated? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So it, so basically everyone was designing their, all the top players designed their lists basically to get hundreds. If they went first, they'd win. And that's all the lists were kind of, pretty much all the lists were skewed to that extent. They had to go first, win hard and get max score. And in a 20, if you were playing 20 nil LGT, you'd be designing the same. You'd have to design a list the same way, because the only way you're getting to the the top four is by getting 20 straight 20s. Yes. So I don't think for the top end it would make any difference to the kind of lists that have been used by the top players. Guys should be going for it. It would certainly make a difference for the for the we'll say the rest the the, the majority of the pack, because you you know lists work differently. Play you know these kind of things. But those like I wouldn't see Manny or Malik in that. Those guys like Petford and that they'd run the same list. They'd run a list that's all about scoring hard early and just crush your opponent for twenty. I think uh, we actually had one situation which highlighted the downfall of the wind loss system very uh, like brightly. Mm. We had a, a one of the games we had. A, on one of the tables, not top tables, but pretty close, like 40 or something, we had a game between two players in which they actually, after finishing, couldn't agree to a score. That was oh, yeah. a 76 to a 75 game on one guy's end, and the other ha- one had it as a perfect draw of 75 to 75. And they just couldn't agree on the, on the result. They had One had one more point for, uh, for the banner, and there was no clear thing, like no easy thing you could do to actually make them agree. And the difference between this one small point in in one of the players' score sheets was the difference between one of them going undefeated and one of them and both of them drawing, so making it out impossible for them to be in the uh, winning bracket. So what do you do in a situation like that? Do you roll a die or? <laughs> That was uh, that was one of the most difficult situations we had. Uh, both players were very angry at the table. Uh, they had clearly had a bad time with each other, uh, and they were both, uh, let's just say, say salty. Mm. They finally decided for a draw, uh, with one player conceding the win. But there isn't really a clear thing you can do in this no. situation. And that I mean, we, we, try, we, tried to, we tried to walk them through it. We were like, okay, 
we want you to go back through each turn and explain when you scored and how you scored because you should vote for an ember but what are the refuse to do it so yes but i i think that's that's a situation which just wouldn't happen in a 20 zero system it just wouldn't uh if you have uh, a margin of error of five points for a 11 uh, and nine score because if every uh, if someone doesn't know the basic score is a 10 10 if you have uh, a perfect draw you have unless you score a five point differential between them it's still a draw yeah. that score would be a draw and there wasn't wasn't going to be any problems with that but in this system just just this one lost point from uh, someone made it very uncomfortable mm -hmm. okay do you think uh the final would have gone differently had alex gone first yes yeah definitely alex Absolutely. will say 60 percent chance alex wins so he goes first. yes so that yeah that's, that's he's done it he's done it before so yeah, he, 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 did, he, did, he did it two rounds in the road and he did it to alex petford to get into the semi-finals yes, and he did, and it, he did to it to mike, mike porter exactly and mike porter he, was not this but pre preco with mike porter was the number one uk player in itc so he's a very very good player his yeah. list was very designed uh, uh he knew he could face Admac. and i like this about his list because for me this list looks quite ridiculous i'm gonna say but it clearly was designed around the fact i'm going to i'm going to play space marines what can i do to actually have a shot at it to have a shot if i go first if uh, i roll well if the stars align can i win and he clearly did he did uh, if he went first against admic twice uh, before the final and he just ch ch shot down three planes some um, chickens some ballistari uh, he had no loss uh, Arcus Sikaran to shoot down yeah. Skitari in cover. His list was uh, built around going first and being able to actually take down Admec, which he did. And yeah. if, if the final Mike Porter, I think he took half of Mike's army off in the first shooting phase. Yeah, exactly. I saw that game uh, basically a, a whole thing, and that was a slaughter. <laughs> yeah. So okay. that could easily have happened if uh, Alex went first in the final. I mean, yeah, it's it's. I guess for Alex, it's it's good consolation that you know it wasn't down to lack of skill or or a mistake or a huge error that someone made. It was just that the dice gods weren't on his side that day, and and that's yeah. it basically. It is, and it is a little bit. I said like it's Alex. If Alex went first, he had a sixty percent chance of winning. I mean, we talked about this, Alex, me and Malik afterwards, and that's literally what they said. They 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 knew that if Malik goes first, Malik wins beyond dice being crazy if alex goes first alex kind of has to have a perfect game or else malik still wins anyway because that's just how intrinsically more powerful the admet codex is but alex is the kind of player that's capable to play a perfect game hence why he was in the final but it's just there's a big imbalance there is a big imbalance in the game it's no secret you know, and Atnek are just way above everybody else. They're so pushed in every direction that GW really needs to take a hard nerf back to them points-wise or something, because it's just outside of team play. Atnek, I believe, will basically end up killing a lot of people's interest in competitive 40k. Which is a shame. All right, uh, let's let's draw this to, to closure. Uh, guys, uh, any final words of, you know, uh, advice or, or any requests toward players that you know plan to head to to tournaments um anything specific that any specific piece of advice that you would like to give them uh mm -hmm. i would love um uh, every player that goes to a tournament even local to read the rules please because <laughs> this this event to me proved that uh it is actually possible for every player even on the low tables to know the rules at least uh at the level in which they can play a game in three hours and have a good time it for so everybody. <laughs> yeah, well, it sometimes just isn't. Yeah. Also, I would like to uh, shout out uh, GW FAQ uh, writers. Please don't nerf those contemptors which Alex had. <laughs> they are the only good thing about the uh, Space Marine Codex at the time. Please don't nerf them to the ground. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> um, All right, yeah. Neil. Reiterate it. If you go into a tournament, in fact, if you're playing 40k in general, read your rulebook, read your codex. It's it's not. I don't think it's that much of an ask um, and it saves a lot of problems 
but at, at the same time, don't be afraid to ask a referee. There's a lot of people that find themselves in tough situations with an opponent who's been tough towards them, who's not maybe been as nice as they should be, and they're afraid to ask a referee because they don't want to be that guy. No, if you if you if you can't solve something, if you and your opponent can't come to can't come to an agreement or can't work out an answer, can't solve something, and and you've tried, ask a referee. That's what yeah. that's what we're here. That's what we're here for. Yeah, and especially now, you know, with the advent of technology and WhatsApp and all that, it's, it's even mm -hmm. simpler now. Exactly. All right, awesome, guys. Do you want to to plug anything? Um, apart from that, Tiffus is rubbish and he smells of wee and poo. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Yeah, right. He was a good. He was a good roommate, though. I will say you that. I shout out okay. Typhus as well for being a good sport for taking me to the tournament, uh, for giving me a chance to prove myself as a um, international referee. But he still smells like poo. It does yeah. change anything. Yeah, and <laughs> he's really, that's and he's fact. really, he's really fat as well. So oh, you're just <laughs> taking advantage of him not being here. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll try to bring him in. You know, I'll I'll I'll, I'll make it fair, so <laughs> he'll get his airtime as well to get back at you guys. Um, <laughs> all right, listen, gents, uh, that it was fantastic. I, I I it's the first time I had such a deep insight into um, um, a, a tournament like that, and I think uh, our listeners as well. Uh, thank you for all the stories. Thank you for all, all the details, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to having you over um, uh, on Contact Lost again. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, happy to come back on. Awesome. Thank you guys. And uh, to everyone, until next time. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Goodbye.